Okay, uh, we're going to make a start. Welcome everyone to the launch of the Routledge Handbook of Marxism and Post-Marxism, edited by Alex Kalinikos, Stathis Kouvalakis and Lucia Pradella. The handbook contains contributions from almost 60 authors and uh, has been described by Michael Lovey as an outstanding contribution to Marxist scholarship and by Leah Ippi as an intelligent and erudite book that shows us not only how to read Marx, but also how to struggle against capitalism. I'm uh, slightly paraphrasing. Uh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, my name is Faisi Ismail, and um, uh, I was also um, glad to have the opportunity to make a small contribution to this handbook with a chapter on Chandra Mahanti and third world feminism, and I'll be chairing uh, this book launch. It's true what people have said about the urgency of such a book in that it reinforces the relevance of Marxism, not only to understanding the world at this current uh, historical conjuncture of multiple crises, uh, but the relevance of Marxism in providing the most rigorous framework and method to address and overcome these crises. As the introduction to the handbook outlines, perhaps one of the most significant contributions of Marx's critique of political economy was that it had an organic connection to the working class. And that for Marx, a practical critique of the existing system was crucial. And so it's deeply um, important that such a book is, is widely read and, and used to inform our analyses of politics beyond academia. Um, Alex Kalinikos is Emeritus Professor of European Studies at King's College uh, London and is the author of many books, including Imperialism and Global Political Economy. He will introduce the handbook for around 10 minutes, and then we will hear from Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, who, as we know, teaches at Columbia University and has contributed to the handbook with a chapter on global marks. Uh, and then we'll hear from Trevor Nguane, who is a socialist and activist from South Africa and has re recent, recently written a book on grassroots democracy in South African shack settlements, Amakomiti. They will each speak for 15 to 20 minutes. And then we will take uh, short uh, contributions from uh, the floor, including from contributors to uh, the handbook. So um, at that point, uh, you can post your, your questions uh, in the chat. So I'll call on Alex to introduce. Thanks very much, Faisy, and hello, everyone. It's great to see so many people, including many friends from around the world. I want to start with a slightly darker note because we're meeting in terrible times which have been taking a toll among the, the Marxists and socialists around the world. And I just want to mention two who are no longer with us. Ed Rooksby, a former student of mine who died at a ridiculously young age over the weekend. And Mick Brooks, a veteran British socialist whose memorial meeting I've just been attending. Uh, we need to remember these people as those who've helped to build the tradition, which certainly I'm trying to continue. Now, as that reference to the, the sad, sad events that are unfolding around us indicates, we live in a world that is very different from the one uh, when the handbook was conceived five and a half years ago. It took a long time to bring it to fruition and a lot of effort. And I'm grateful to everyone who has contributed to, to that. Um, today, we live in a world where we're confronted, as Faisy said, with multiple crises. The economic crisis that really began in 2007, eight, and that continues in a more acute form today. Um, there's the biological crisis which is a consequence to a very large extent of capitalism's increasing destruction of nature. And then there's the political crisis, summed up, I think, by the assault on the Capitol in Washington on the 6th of, 6th of January. The, we got a sudden existential blow that made us aware of the extent of the threat from the far right to today. And I would say that these crises, terrible though they are in their combination, 
vindicate the project that we um, we we that the handbook represents, because we sought to present uh, a diverse and militant Marxism in dialogue with other currents. Hence, it's a handbook of Marxism and post-Marxism, which Dr. Spivak uh, represents in such a distinguished way. We wanted to challenge the myth that Marx was Eurocentric and that he wasn't interested in issues such as race, gender, and ecology. And in a key chapter on called Foundation, Lucia uh, wrote about Marx himself and showed how his critique of political economy was a critique of capitalism as a global system, inherent in which was imperialism and racism, and that the anti-colonial struggles that were developing in Marx's days were central to his conception of how capitalism would be ended. Our aim was more broadly to decenter Marxism. That's why, for example, there's a section called Tricontinental, which um, includes a range of thinkers, very diverse range, um, who, for whom um, Marxism was a tool in the struggle against imperialism, racism, and gender, gender impression, oppression. So we have figures like Lenin, like Connolly, like Maria Tagui, like Mao, like C.L.R. James, like Franz Fanon, like Angela Davis, like Huey uh, Newton, like Chandra Mahanti. Um, we wanted to give a sense of the range, the internationalism, and the intrans intransigent opposition to the present system in all its aspects. We chose to do this through a series of long contextual essays plus shorter entries on individual thinkers or mainly on individual thinkers. We thought this was better than concentrating uh, on themes and concepts because you can bring out the specificity of individual thinkers better if you look at their distinctive problematics, not just, let's say, fetishism, but how Lukács deals with fetishism, Adorno, whoever. Um, but there's a vulnerability that arises in this way of, of doing it. First of all, you can be criticized for whom you include and in particular whom you exclude. Maybe it's a sign of the strength of a handbook um, to the, ex the, the extent to which um, it's criticized for those it's forced to, to leave out. But also, if you're covering a range of thinkers who you think is essential, you have to wait on, sometimes for a long time, on the different contributors to, to deliver. And this is one reason why it took so long for the handbook come out from when it was initially commissioned at the beginning of 2016, there was one happy result of the delay, which was that it meant that in the spring of 2020, we could, at the encouragement of Rutledge, the publishers, add uh, an extra final section on Marx in an age of catastrophe. And I think that I'm in a, in a way the world has developed, allowed us to, to synthesize what we were saying in the handbook in a way that we wouldn't have been able to, to otherwise. I'm very grateful to John Bellamy Foster and Intan Suwandi for providing a very substantial uh, analysis of the COVID-19 pandemic, applying the Marxist critique of capitalism and imperialism to illuminate the, the pandemic that makes that final section. Um, but through that, we were able to show that Marx inaugurated a tradition for which catastrophe, in other words, not as one communist, French communist once said, the, uh, the tomorrows that sing, the, the glorious future, but catastrophe is an intrinsic part of Marx's thinking, and that Marxism, particularly through the kind of ecological Marxism, represented, for example, by John Bellamy Foster 
and that uh, Camilla Royal uh, wrote about in, in the handbook, Marxism, particularly through this ecological tradition, can help us to understand why we're in the grip of this age of catastrophe, as I think we have to call the, the present, um, that was announced not just by the pandemic, but by the floods and fires that we see around the world, from Beira in Mozambique to uh, San Francisco uh, uh, last, uh, last year. Moreover, uh, there are classical Marxist thinkers like Trotsky and Gramsci that provide us with the intellectual tools that we need to understand what is called in a superficial way pop populism, but that is really the rise of the most dangerous far right that we've seen since the interwar period with an increasingly aggressive and assertive fascist, fascist fringe. Now, um, it's always good, this is such a long and long process um, that uh, at the end, you, you uh, can look back and wonder about what you could have done be better. And what, so what self-criticisms would, would I make? These are my personal criticisms. I'm not saying Stathis or Lucia would agree with them. First of all, I think it's maybe a bit too biased towards high theory. You know, the grand figures like Adorno and Althusser and so on and so forth, both of whom I love, I'm not dismissing them, but maybe there should have been more an edge of activism uh, to, to there. Uh, because Marxism, as Fazy said, is about the unity of theory and practice. But also, I think maybe, uh, I don't think we went far enough in uh, our aim of diversifying Marxism. Lucia said not long ago that we should have included uh, uh, an entry on W.E. Du Bois. And when she said it, it was too late to do anything about it, I kicked myself. Because Du Bois's black reconstruction in America is I think one of the great Marxist classics in its way comparable to let's say Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution or James's Black Jacobins. It's a, a marvelous work that combines structure, process and agency in the most, in the most brilliant and, and compelling way. And, uh, Jay, in the book, uh, Du Bois says something that is very relevant to our present uh, situation. He said, here is the real modern labor problem. Out of the exploitation of the dark proletariat comes the surplus value fil filched from human breasts, which in, cultures land, in cultured lands, the machines and harness power veil and conceal. The emancip emancipation of man, it should have uh, that is something we would need to change. The emancipation of hum human beings is the eman emancipation of labor and the freeing of labor is the freeing of that basic majority of workers who are yellow, brown and black. Now, I think that speaks very powerfully to the present when we think about who has been victimized most cruelly by the pandemic and by all the other mechanisms of racism and repression that operate in the, in the world today. But it's important, and this is one of Marx's most important insights, to see this dark proletariat, not just as, as victims, but as agents. Agents, not just of resistance to what has happened, uh, is happening, but also agents of liberation from this world with all its cruelties. And that's the basic insight that the Marxism that we explore in the handbook is uh, is providing. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Alex. That's great, and that's perfect timing. Um, okay, so we'll now hear from Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to do this. It's a bit terrifying. And good morning, afternoon and good evening to all of you. Um, yes, Alex, we are in a time of unbelievable crisis and my, both in my country of citizenship, India, and my country of residence, United States. So it ain't just the 6th of February in the United States. India is also 
going slowly into a theocratic hell. Anyway, um, the notice says we will discuss how to learn to use Marx in a world in turmoil. I cannot do a how-to. I'm very much hoping Trevor can. I will say a few things in 20 minutes about how I have been learning from my mistakes facing a world in turmoil as best I can. A world in turmoil. It is a relief map. Many different diachronies, historical narratives have come together by the grace of the silicon chip into one synchrony, one contemporaneity, one modernity. Everything is modern. Marx had predicted this. Orunodai Mukherjee, always look for caste in an Indian name. Even if they're now politically correct, as indeed am I, they have millennially received massive historical advantages. This is partly why I can't do a how-to. Anyway, this nice young man said on BBC World News yesterday morning that India was a huge e-commerce market with matching statistics. Of course, you can't tell when exactly he said it. Loop News is an allegory. Read symbolic if you're ir irritated by POMO. Loop News is an allegory of the false level playing field in the place of our wild relief map promised by globalization. If you wish to see what happens when an official map, here Israel, is quote, opened up into its texture, see Tariq Sidi, Grandfather's Path by Nizar Hassan. Incidentally, the documentary also brings up the initial admiration of and desire to collaborate with the colonizers. Here's a great distinction between slavery and colonialism and also this uh, to acknowledge complicity for those of us who are from post-colonial nations so-called is extremely important so that we don't think pointing fingers that everything began with the play of capital and colony. Here's Nizar Hassan. ذكرت سروني بكتب الرحال الأوروبيين وبخرائطهم سنة 1829 و1857 كان عدد سكانها لما خلق سيدي يكدر ب250 نسمة بحسب إحصائيات جمعية استكشاف فلسطين البريطانية أما حسب إحصائيات الإمبراطورية العثمانية بنفس الفترة فكان عددهم 300 يقال أيضا عن عرض سروني كانت ملك لمفتي الناصري وباع عام 1909 قسم كبير منها للجمعية اليهودية لاستعمار فلسطين وسوريا سروني لمنتز Here now is the complicity الألمان هنا نساء ورجال صحاح الأجسام وعصر القول أنه لا ريب بأن هذا النسل العامل هو أرقى طبقة في حيفا سواء كان باعتبار معيشته أو ثروته أو علمه أو معرفته يقول أن الأقضية الأخرى عبارة عن مجاري مياه مفتوحة وحمار يملؤون الماء منها وقرى قذرة وصبيان يلعبون بالتراب وهم حفاء عرى قد سترتهم طبقات من الذباب طلع إن الكتلة الإسلامية في حيفا هي حط الطبقات وأضعفها من جهة الحياة الاجتماعية وإن أحط المح... This is his grandfather whom he adores but we have to acknowledge that there was this collaboration almost everywhere. And yet, given this wildly unequal subject ship, the task is still and persistently to generate a general will for social justice, minimally defined as the willingness to turn capital away from capitalism to diversified social good. A minimal definition is needed because it must travel into the bottom of the relief map among people who are 
illiterate or ill-educated, yet not necessarily lacking in intelligence or imagination. Typically, when we think tricontinental, subaltern, and post-colonial studies, we think in terms of nation states. But think Syria, think Yemen, think of the war camps in the Middle East and Kashmir, think of the migrants in capsizing boats heading toward Europe. In a panel at the Modern Language Association in January, we will try to define the Rohingya as stateless. Angela Davis has tentatively agreed to think of the world's incarcerated as stateless. And a physicist who has been tirelessly working for the nuclear tested Marshall Islanders will seek to define the terrain of nuclear testing as stateless. How can we even penetrate to quote, use marks unquote in these areas? My access is only to a bit of Kwara state in Nigeria, a bit of Accra, Ghana, a bit of Dakar, Senegal, a bit of Buenos Aires, a past experience in Hawaii, all for 10 or 11 to 20 years. And my 33 years of training teachers in subaltern rural areas of Western West Bengal. My minimal definition of quote subaltern is Gramsci's formula, quote social groups in the margins of history. I focus on greed, lobe in Bengali as a basic affect. Thus, Professor Margaret Macmillan, great granddaughter of Lloyd George in her wreath lecture, and I quote, these affects, greed, violence, fear, do of course drive capitalism's dark side, a side that most of us can afford not to notice. In spite of all its terrible problems, my area of work in West Bengal was liberated by the Communist Party Marxist CPM. I am walking with an elderly man to see his ecological produce in his pocket handkerchief of a plot loaned him by the man he sharecrops for. A member of the rural gentry gives me a namaskar. My companion says to me, Didi, sister, you see the sandals on my feet? When I was young, that man's father would have snatched them from my feet. I'm an untouchable. How dare I wear sandals? And would then have whipped me good and hard. How did this change, asked I, shocked. Party didi, said he. So they know Pujibad, capitalism is bad because it extracts munafa, profit, and the landless peasants remain poor. They fight for the party, but their own desire is to make money. I hope I am supplementing there B.R. Ambedkar's lack of confidence in a sense of democracy in the Indian social structure. Take a look at his interview with BBC. Dr. Bitter, do you think democracy is going to work in India? No. It's simply a formal thing people want. What do you mean? I mean the paraphernalia of democracy. Simply elections, prime ministers, and so on and so on. Well, elections are very important. No. Elections are important provided they produce really good men. But aren't they important because they allow allowed to change the government? I mean, it's better to change peaceably than who has got the idea, you see, that voting means change your government. Nobody has. People have no consciousness. They have no idea that they have to change the government. You see, we have a sort which never allows the man to choose the candidate. Not having to vote the man for the candidate. Not having to choose the candidate. Not having to the candidate. Not having to choose the candidate. Not having to choose Yes, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. The man never cared who represented the Bula. Though he was a donkey who represented the Bula. You see? Or a very educated man who represented the Bula. He simply voted for the Bula. Well, the best common community party system 
tried an extra moral lesson in desiring social justice with my teachers and supervisors this way. The task of devising a pedagogy to insert the children into the intuitions of democracy. Since they vote, they must learn that democracy is other people through habit of mind, although they are themselves dirt poor. This is another intellectual problem where I must learn how to step away from competitive knowledge, which I inhabit at Columbia. So I bring up an old proverb with my um, supervisors and teachers. Um, we, myself and my co-workers, I say to them, have money so we can be morally outraged. But it is understandable that you who have never had money and now through being educated, you can make money and want money. You cannot be faulted. But you do know the proverb, I say to them, lobhe pap, papi mrittu, sin and greed, death in sin. Yes, yes, they say. So should we stop being greedy? Yes, they say. No, say I, we would fail. I'm greedy too, I like money. Let me rewrite the proverb for you. Lobhe lab, akir labhe onek in mrittu, profit in greed. One person's profit brings death to many. Keep what you need, but use the rest for greater good. I changed the proverb for them, but must follow this up in every conversation to see if the desire to restrain greed is taking hold. For the smartest among them, who was chosen by CPM to run for the Panchayat local self-government elections, and could not file his nomination papers because the party in power threatened to harm his family. He has taken a bank loan, bought a printer, and basically running an ATM for the local illiterates under COVID and running an online business in makeup, etc. Yet he has never seen a plane or an airport and I must remain on his case. Although the party tells them about capitalism and profit, no one has explained to them the theft of surplus value that Alex um, uh, quoted Du Bois as mentioning that this is the basic thing. No one has explained to them the theft of surplus value in the simplest minimal definition, perhaps because there are no factories in the area. As I learn how to make Marxist convictions, rather than simply solving their own problems, infect their minds. I see what travels and the theft of surplus value is one of them. As I wrote in the essay included in the handbook, I quote myself, Rick Wolf has taught us how to go back and back and back along the chain of the promises of security in securitized and unsecuritized debts we once again arrive at the fact of the theft of surplus value that allows capitalism to flourish." End of quote. In 90, I want to dwell on this a little bit to show the range. In 1978, when I began teaching at the University of Texas at Austin, I was told by 13 students, undergraduates, that they wanted to read Marx. I said that I was hired by the English department so they asked me to propose a course on Victorian nonfiction prose. They said, you put in the usual Carlyle and Matthew Arnold, etc. But then when you start teaching, teach Marx, they will all drop, but we will be there. Teaching Marx by this ruse. When I taught the basic thing about the theft of surplus value, a student from accountancy asked in anguish, why hasn't anyone taught us this? It made me realize how important it was 
to notice this basic fact. Primitive accumulation in a broad and minimal definition, the work of the capitalization of land, the simplest definition of quote, originary or primitive accumulation, making way for full-fledged industrial capitalism offered by Marx, now with direct access to the world market, also travels to the subaltern voter. That work is far from finished. The Amazon forest is of course the greatest example. Closer to home, accessible to my activist experience is the example of Ghana and Nigeria and the agriculture of West Bengal. I am very much hoping that Joseph Odula Frimpong and Oluwaseun Akintenwa among my co-workers in Africa have had the time and the internet to watch this discussion. In West Bengal, the poorest sharecropping farmers are being tempted by localized nationalism by the Hindu Nationalist Party. Tempted by localized call in a language native to West Bengal, but not to the central state. So in a bad accent, which the locals will the even the illiterate peasants, I hope will notice at Mutocha, a handful of rice. Shono bhai chashi. Listen, brother peasant, these are the things that the BJP has learned to say to come into the village, villages. This is an example of insertion into globalized capital. I have been able to explain this to my teachers and supervisors. They know that the illiterate farmers will not be able to understand. So these subalterns on the way to citizenship, my supervisors and teachers, they must explain to the illiterate farmers that the first promise of money will not be kept. Generally, the party bosses do not know how to talk to the rural subalterns. It is necessary to take the time to learn if you want to use Marx. The agency is in the hands of the teachers and supervisors, themselves a generation from illiteracy, landless. They will represent the global as local, Bangla Bachao, save Bengal's life. That's not the issue, but that's what the illiterate peasants will understand. Orunduti Roy, in a lovely interview with BBC World, keeps the problem confined to India. No, this is a global problem. And indeed, she keeps it confined to Delhi. She reminds us correctly that it began in the 60s when the so-called, quote, green revolution, pretty much selling agriculture to Monsanto and Cargill, put the lid on, quote, red revolution. This I have been able to share with the Dalits I work for. A left of center friend argues for free trade and still thinks only of India. By placing price control in the hands of the corporate sector, land capitalization is now being directly inserted into global capital. There is much to say about this, but I will simply mention Disha Ravi, who has been detained for sharing documents as a key conspirator. What conspiracy is there? And I will add that all global movement against land grab connects in this struggle against primitive accumulation, even to reverse it. For a citation, I will give you Land Back, a Yellowhead Institute red paper, which is about, I quote, about reclaiming indigenous jurisdiction, breathing life into rights and responsibilities, and the planting of rice again in the Nigerian savannas, which is being undermined by African capitalism, planting of rice again in the Nigerian savannas, where the planters are mostly women who have no concept of Niger Nigeria, as indeed the illiterate peasants don't of West Bengal. And they speak the unsystematized native languages of, of Africa, which are extremely powerful, but of course, unrecognized by the development workers for whom the wealth of language is a problem because they are basically monolingual capitalists. The local branch of the party, on the other hand, want to join up the local branch in West Bengal. The local branch of the party, on the other hand, want to join up in the hope that later they can build themselves back up again. How do I know this from these uh, teachers and supervisors? And it is the subalterns partially on the way to citizenship 
that are beginning to meet to teach them better. I have been learning then that in order to use Marx for accessing the global, we must think the citizen rather than the worker as the agent of Marxism. I got the idea first from W.E.B. Du Bois, the study of black reconstruction and the civil war amendments, 13, 14, 15. The pulverizing of the factory floor, the, this phrase comes from Asia Labor Monitor, and the hostility to outsourcing, as well as the collaboration between labor and management makes labor vulnerable today in many ways and in supplementing vanguardism and organizing to promote class consciousness, a collective international striving must travel from absolute hands-on detail, learning to rearrange desires to the generalizations of policy. By supplement is meant breaking open a totality to fill a hole in it and even introducing the incalculable. Black Lives Matter in its demand for full access to citizenship with its acknowledgement of the incalculability of the trans subject is such a supplement to obstinate Eurocentric clamor for correct summaries of Marxist doctrines. The lesson of COVID is redistributing to essential workers, highly gendered in different ways. In other words, socialism. It is also for human beings to behave thinking about other people, namely democracy, democratic socialism. I'm a New Yorker, need I say more? But we fight against the sentimentalization, capitalization, or policification only of this lesson. I'm not against policy, but policy enforces. Our struggle, learning from the emergence of bad capitalism in Russia and capitalism in China, is to transform enforcement into a desire for social justice, persistently supplementing democratic socialism in an extra moral way. This is not a moralist argument. I have not yet been able to learn how to make climate change behavior internalized by the subaltern groups I work for. I cannot discuss this for lack of time, but the issues around climate change are also sentimentalized and capitalized by the corporate sector, corporate social responsibility, helping sustainable underdevelopment. I'm speaking in riddles now, hoping to expand in the Q&A. But I find an acceptance of working for the future, for the work might not finish in our lifetime among these subalterns. No anxiety about deliverables here. They can move with Marx's idea of the realm of freedom beyond social engineering. They can even move with the content of revolution being the poetry of the future, although, quote, poetry remains somewhat elite. It has been suggested that the subaltern accesses the public sphere by bringing religion into crisis. I believe Ambedkar was at work learning the mindset of his fellow Dalits across class lines by becoming a Buddhist, although he did not live long enough to implement this epistemological change. Siddhartha Gautama being a prince had access to the refined language, the word Sanskrit, of course, meaning refined, but he chose to do his preaching and his discourse in the language of the common people, which was not acknowledged. In one generation, his spirit was destroyed. Everything was translated into Sanskrit and we had the Mahayana Buddhism that moved to Korea and China and so on, and Theravada Buddhism, which in Pali became a heavily ritualized, magnificent, but ritualized Tibetan religion, almost polytheist. I will end with a word about disability. Yesterday on a BBC item on astronaut recruitment, we heard, I quote, in terms of space travel, we are all disabled. I have suggested that the subject is always disabled. We start living and dying when we are born. Rather than consider the trans disabled, the people of color disabled, women disabled, the aged disabled, the illiterate disabled in casting a normal vote, we should learn to think that this, within brackets, 
this ability is ability. This may be POMO, but I need those brackets, Terry. You remember Terry Eagleton deciding that this type of typographic play made my work like a Pakistani supermarket. I hesitate to use the R word. No, the brackets signify an invitation to mind change. Acknowledge that normal is a methodological necessity that must set aside the acknowledgement of general disability, so-called, in order to keep making decisions. If citizenship is the new site of agency in a global capitalist world full of turmoil, the normal subject cannot be the male capitalist subject in an extended prime of life. Thank you for listening. I cut myself off here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gayatri, for those insights. Um, so next we'll hear from Trevor Nguane. Trevor, are you there? Um, yes, thank you very much. It's an honor to be on this uh, panel. Thanks to the organizers, uh, to uh, Gayatri Spivak, and to everyone who's logged on to listen to this discussion. So firstly, I want to congratulate the editors of the book and the authors, the contributors. It is a great book. It calls itself a handbook. And indeed, I would call it a Marxist user's manual. It is a handbook insofar as it holds your hand as you walk through the complex terrain of the development of Marxist theory and the emergence of post-Marxism, especially during the 20th century. It is a good introduction to this board of literature and also it serves as a good refresher cause for those who have heard it all and seen it all before. Because there is a freshness in the way the debates are presented and revisited. And also there is a subtle but unmistakable grounding in today's realities, concerns, and sensibilities. And it also looks at uh, key debates among and between Marxists and post-Marxists showing the convergences and divergences. It's a long book, 46 chapters are dedicated to specific authors. You know, uh, I think uh, Comrade Alex mentioned them. I'll add Angela Davis, Franz Fanon, Wallerstein. It's a treasure trove. Also, there are 10 chapters that introduce and frame the issues and the historical periods. So in sum, uh, it's a great read, it's a must read. Now, comrades, this book comes at a time when humanity faces many challenges, which uh, the previous speakers have commented uh, or mentioned. COVID-19, climate change, the rich getting richer, right-wing populism, etc. Now, as Friedrich Engels once wrote, our theory, Marxism, is not a dogma, but a guide to action. So the question which I want to ask today is, to what extent can Marxism inform our response to the challenges facing humanity today? The second question, which arises from the book, the handbook, what insights can we get uh, from post-Marxism? And of course, maybe a third question, what can we learn from the interaction and the debates between Marxism and those we can uh, call as falling or see as falling under the post-Marxism camp? So this book is a very good starting point in answering uh, these questions. Chapter one, you know, it's, a, it's written by one of the editors, Lucia Pradella. It's titled Foundation, Karl Marx, 1880 to 1883. So today it is 138 years since Karl Marx died. But I think the theoretical foundation he set remains unshakable because the truth is capitalism rests on 
the private ownership of the bosses and the exploitation of workers. The ruling class benefits, the working class suffers. And all the allied classes, the subalterns, which uh, Gayatri was talking about. Chapter two of the handbook uh, is on Friedrich Engels, written by Roland Boer. Uh, so it notes the research conducted by Engels, which culminated in his book, The Condition of the Working Class in England, where Engels mapped out the suffering of the laboring classes under the early capitalist system. But one thing important about Marx and Engels, the founder, so to speak, for them, the working class were not just victims of the capitalist bosses. You know, for Marxism, the working class is the revolutionary subject, something which I think Gayatri is grappling with. So, or was grappling with, the working class is the class of producers. So everything we see, you know, has been produced by the hands of workers or by machines made by the hands of workers. Yes, a lot has changed. There are technological developments. There is talk of a new economy, the fourth industrial revolution. But I think the working class, the producers remain central to the operation of capitalism. Production is in the hands of the working class. It does not matter how much there's a gig economy or how much work is online or how many tasks can be automated. There has to be production even to allow these things to happen. There has to be food, there has to be power, you know, construction, distribution, clothes, water, People in the gig economy need these things. People working online need these things. People busy engineering automation need these basic things. So we can still, in any case, pose the question, has capitalism changed since Marx and Engels observed it and wrote about it? Now, Marx said capitalism is a dynamic system. And he said, its technological changes are breathtaking and will be breathtaking. Remember that uh, famous, uh, slightly dramatic sentence, all that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned. So Marx knew that this system you know, is a changing monster. So the handbook, uh, the book we're discussing uh, today, explains the path of post-Marxism by reference to these changes. So for example, there's a chapter on Frederick J. Jameson, you know, written by Robert T. Taylor Jr. So Jameson argues that uh, the questioning of Marxism uh, by, Marx, uh, by the post-Marxists or the questioning of the Marxian paradigm arises when capitalism seems to change its spots, when it seems to you know, acquire new uh, attributes. So now in response, you know, for example, Fanon, uh, because of his situation in Algeria, fighting colonialism, fighting the French bourgeoisie, the cap he felt that we have to stretch Marxism in order to make sense of the situation here. Others uh, get that temptation, a strong temptation to conclude that the paradigm itself has been overtaken and outmoded and that we, we need new theories. So, um, in a way, what we're saying here and what the book, the handbook tells me is that, uh, you know, Marxism itself, because it's a guide to action, will change post Marxism and even anti Marxism emerge in relation to changes in the system, you know, be it technology, be it the class structure, be it be the geographic reach of the system as it leaves 
that little corner, small corner Marx talked about with Engels and spread throughout the world to even the place where I'm sitting in Johannesburg. So this helps us to understand, you know, the dynamism of the theorization and even the challenges to the theorization. Of course, also capitalism is experienced, you know, where you are along national dimensions, race, gender, etc. So those are the issues uh, which uh, we are grappling with. And I think those are some of the issues uh, Comrade Spivak was raising. So I think that uh, the handbook uh, in its various chapters deals very well and in very, in very specific ways with each of the various post-Marxisms, you know, it uh, tries to address in response to these questions. So you get questions like post-capitalism, post-industrialism, you know, it's all about uh, changes which people are grappling to make sense of. But I want to say that it seems to me, and I think probably uh, I'm on the same uh, wavelength with the editors of the book, it seems to me that the structural dynamics of capitalism have not changed much, you know, uh, capital accumulation, the drive to make profits, the generation of surplus value, the exploitation of the working class, etc. So, in fact, to me, there's more continuity than discontinuity. And even the variation and differentiation, some of which uh, uh, Comrade Gayash was talking about, you know, the unemployed, uh, those who are um, unemployed workers, those who never worked, because capitalism, capital, you know, creates, uh, you know, unemployed workers, but it also creates uh, unemployed workers. You know, capitalism can sometimes work, uh, you know, like the old imperialist uh, armies, the British army in the anglo Boer war, you know, here in South Africa, it can be experienced as a scorched earth policy where there's development over there, skyscrapers going up, but in some sections of the world, in some parts of the world or some parts of a country, nothing is happening. You know, it's just doom and gloom. So all that is because of how the system uh, develops. Uh, it's part of the dynamic of the system. That is why I say that there is more continuity uh, than uh, discontinuity. Now, uh, of course, some post-Marxists, because they vary, people like Angela Davis, you know, uh, some people have called them post-Marxists, but they still work within, they try to relate, you know, to the Marxist paradigm. But others, you know, take it a step further, like Laclau and Mouf, uh, and then others, you know, declare Marxism dead. So my point here is that often when Marxism is declared dead or old head, this often means the working class is also declared dead or irrelevant. So there is a problem here. If the producers in a system of production are declared irrelevant, you know, if their power, at least their potential power as the people who make the system work is not recognized, if the power is not strategized about or around, if the power is not activated, then I don't think we're going to have a strong way forward fighting that system and uh, its effects. In other words, it, it doesn't mean that the possibilities are not there. It just means that there are obstacles that are put in the way uh, of fighting uh, against a system. So an example, you know, we see a lot of anger and frustration. We see protest movements, even strikes. But the question is, especially if we look at it from the point of view of the working class, you know, of the masses who are victims uh, of uh, uh, capital, uh, will Will the angry and frustrated workers have hope? Will the anger be enriched by hope 
and vision of building something different? Will there be a vision of alternatives in the midst of that anger? A vision of real solutions? Now, I think that uh, if workers don't have hope, don't have confidence in themselves, firstly as producers, uh, in their power together to fight behind their needs for their needs, you know, you know, it's not that a vacuum is left. What happens is that competitiveness, suspicion takes over. Individualism uh, occupies that space. In fact, a political hopelessness, a hopelessness in politics is the result when there's no hope, when there is no self-confidence. Now, workers need anger and hope to move forward, fighting for their needs. But where can that hope come from if that hope is trampled upon again and again? So, uh, I would say anything and everything which promotes that crisis of confidence which undermines the hope of a different world is not just a, a partial or part of the system, it is a part of the problem. Because workers fight best behind a vision of alternatives, behind the dream of a different future, a better future. And sometimes this is something we learned here when we're fighting against apartheid, you know, during the 80s. You know, sometimes uh, what we need and what we had was clear knowledge and vision about how the only solution for workers, indeed for humanity and for nature, is to overthrow capitalism. So that clear vision becomes buried you know, by the mark of bourgeois thinking. And I might say uh, in relation to workers' organizations by the politics of class collaboration, what uh, Comrade Alex would call the politics of reformism. So when workers uh, are not allowed to dream, uh, you know, or when their dream is made small, the dream becomes infested, diseased. So the retreat from the big dream of something different, of a system beyond capitalism, you know, the strategy uh, or theorizations against the totalizing vision, you know, the preference by certain theoreticians, strategists, even within the working class for fragmented solutions, for localism, the small dream, the small vision, uh, I think it's a problem. Because uh, usually, you know, that is linked to denying, to a denial of the power of the working class as a class, not only in one country, you know, but as an international force against a totalizing capitalist system. So anything which makes workers less likely to see their own power, you know, anything that undermines workers' confidence in themselves, that divides them up, you know, whether along racial, gender, whatever lines, you know, anything that makes them not realize their power to change history as producers or as uh, allied, as family members, you know, as comrades, as compatriots of those, you know, who produce, you know, such as the unemployed workers, such as the peasants, you know, those theories, those strategies are not different parts of a solution. They are part of the problem. They don't open up new possibilities. They are obstacles. So I think that it is possible and necessary to have theories that support the development of, of hope and confidence and collective strategy uh, of the working class and of the masses of those uh, suffering under the book, the jackboot of capitalism. So to conclude, I would say that, uh, yes, we live in difficult times, as we've mentioned, COVID-19, climate change, rich getting richer, whatever. Rosa Luxemburg, 
She's got a chapter there in that book. Uh, someone is dealing with her. Said the choice facing humanity is between socialism or barbarism. Barbarism. So the question today is: Is there a moment of possibility in the midst, in the middle of that barbarism? You know. So this is the idea that uh, the writer Arundhati Roy was trying to convey when she wrote that inspiring piece, The Pandemic is a Portal, where she said, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. So comrades, friends, colleagues, austerity, climate change, job cuts, these attacks, all of them, they come from the same enemy, you know, the bosses and their governments. They are attacks against victims who belong to the same class or who belong to the same mass of people, you know, who struggle uh, under misery and hardship of the system. These people, it doesn't matter that they are in different organizations. They are in different countries. They are of different races, uh, different sexes, sexual orientations in different continents even. So because they all suffer against the jackpot uh, of capital, you know, because they have the same enemy, you know, uh, the basis is there for the needs, for their needs, you know, for their struggles. The basis is there that we can develop a unifying set of demands so that in the midst of the barbarism, uh, there is a moment of possibility. So as much as we struggle with immediate issues of everyday life, you know, we have to take the lesson of history, which is there in the book, you know, repeated again and again in place after place. And that lesson is that the struggle of everyday life will be pushed back without a vision of building a different power. This is what I think uh, the handbook underlines, you know, and I really congratulate the editors and all those who contributed to writing this uh, great book. Thank you very much, comrades. Thank you so much, Trevor. That was that was inspiring. That's excellent. Um, so you can keep posting your questions in the chat. Um, some of the things that have come out from um, from what's been discussed so far are around the structural dynamics of capitalism, whether these have changed, whether there's more continuity than change. And of course, the centrality of, uh, of the working class as an agent of change. Uh, um, I think both speakers have, um, have spoken to that. I, I, I just want to ask if there perhaps are two or three con contributors, uh, people who have written chapters that want to um, say a couple of things, two or three minutes each, and then I'll take um, a few questions from the chat and then we can go back to uh, some, of the, some of the contributors. Um, so if any of the contributors would like to um, raise their hands, you can speak for two minutes. And I'll just do that when you've got two minutes, when, you're, when, you've, when you've done two minutes, um, and then you can start to wrap up, just so we can get as many contributions and, and, and questions uh, as possible. So, um, yeah. I've, I can see John Molyneux's hand, but actually I'm not even sure if John is a contributor. Uh, Lucia will know <laughs> whether John is a contributor. No, I'm not. I'm not. I just put my okay. hand up. Well, I will. I will. I will. I, I hope to take you later, John. But I know that Kieran Allen is a contributor, so I'll take Kieran um, yes. first, and then if somebody else wants to put up their hand, you're more. You're. You're most welcome. So, Kieran. Kieran, are you there? Sorry. Uh, um, a lot of emphasis has been placed mm -hmm. on. Sorry. A lot of emphasis has been placed on the issue of the age of catastrophe. I want to stress, I think, that it is also an age of revolt, starting with, for example, the farmers in India, stretching to Lebanon, stretching to the Black Lives Matter movement. And therefore, the challenge for Marxists is how they relate to this huge level of revolt, which, by the way, is only is happening now before 
COVID breaks and God knows what will happen after COVID. And what I want to really emphasize is really the, the danger for me is a notion that Marxism is confined to the universities and that we have waiting, somehow we're in a state of waiting until the organized working class or rather an idealized version of the organized working class appears to become the agent of change. I don't see it like that. I think that first of all, in the type of crisis we're in, faced with the failure of social democracy and of Stalinism, which is if you like wrecked terrible hardship on working class politics, I think we'll find much more complex events happening. Namely, people can revolt politically before they revolt industrially. People can look to Jeremy Corbyn or to Bernie Sanders before they start taking strike action. Uh, peasants can move before workers. Community action can take place before factory action. And therefore, for me, the crucial thing for Marxists is to be creative and to understand that we have to take Marxism out of the universities into whatever transitional spaces that allow real existing working people who want to revolt to begin to go on a journey. And the contribution for Marxists is precisely to have that creativity to be able to relate to transitional type organizations rather than just simply Marxists being by themselves in a vanguard organization, we have to learn how to relate to the revolts that are happening today. And for me, the crucial thing is being part of a transitional organization that has people who are left reformists, people who are revolutionaries, but the contribution that Marxists will make is to go on a journey with those people to convince them patiently that the aim is to overthrow capitalism by means of revolution. But we'll only do that if we're part of those wider movements. Thanks so much, Kieran. Um, so next I'll take um, uh, Royal. Hi, um, thanks, Tracy. Um, my name's Camilla. Um, as Alex very kindly mentioned, I wrote the, the little bit on ecological Marxism. Um, we had to kind of change it and add to it a little bit because um, since conceiving of this book, there have been you know, not only natural disasters, but also um, some quite uh, radical and to me inspiring environmental movements. Um, but what I wanted to mention was I was quite interested in some of the points in the chat and I'm sure other people will speak as well, but there's a point about what kind of project Marxism is and is it a project of modernity? And, um, you know, I, I would say no. Um, to me, modernity is founded on a separation of humanity and nature. I mean, at least that's what, you know, Latour and others would would um, describe it as. Um, I think Marxism, um, I think Marxist project is very different from, from that. It's, you know, they talk about, Marx and Engels talk about the first premise of human history is the existence of living human individuals. First fact to be established, it's physical organization of these individuals and their consequent relation to the rest of nature. So it's a project that starts from humans as part of nature, you know, a differentiated part, but still part of it. And that doesn't see the issue of nature is something somehow separate from the the economic system that that we live in um so this is kind of i think this is why i call it ecological marxism they might not have used the word ecology back in in the 19th century but it's an ecology and that it's about it's a relational way of of thinking and it's it is an ongoing project of course that many more people have contributed to and debated and that that kind of conti continues onwards um so yeah that's what i wanted to say Thanks, Camilla. Um, so some of the contributors are being rather shy about speaking, um, but I will next take John Narayan and um, and then I'll take some uh, questions from the chat. I'll just read them out and um, yeah, and the, and the speakers can um, speak to them uh, in the when they wrap up. So John. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not sure I actually chose to talk. I think I've been made to talk, um, you know, uh, <laughs> but you know, I'll do it. Um, so, um, for those who don't know me, I wrote the chapter in the handbook on Huey P. Newton and the Black Panther Party. And in a sense, uh, the chapter really starts with one of my favorite quotes from Huey P. Newton, which is about uh, Marxist Lenin yeah. being stuck in yeah. and three. What was it that? Did you read the chapter? Was it that bad? Um, no, I'll start again. And it's about the idea that basically Marxist-Leninism cannot be static. Those of us who embrace a Marxist-Leninism that is, is static are actually not really Marxist-Leninists or not Marxists. In fact, we just practice a kind of flunkyism, right? And so that is the key part for how Marxism has developed over the last 200 years. 
is that it's a constantly evolving project that has been taken on and espoused in different contexts. Um, so the idea that Marxism is Eurocentric is often very odd. So when we teach Marxism, we often get very, you know, bright students go, well, that's a Eurocentric, um, that's a Eurocentric philosophy. And you're like, well, I'm gonna teach you Marxism from the, from, from the global South, from the Caribbean, from Africa, from, from Asia. Suddenly it doesn't look so Eurocentric, right? But one of the big things that um, the Black Panther Party did, and I think this links back to what Kieran was saying, was the old institutions of how we organize in the 20th century um, have in many ways been weakened, right? Whether that's unionism, whether that's just the nature of employment, whether that's the way racism punctuates our idea of, of, of politics across the nation. And in a sense, what Marxism did for um, the Black liberation struggle via the Panthers was to say, we need to build new institutions. We need to build new institutions that can deal with the new, and new realities of the working class. And that, in a sense, is where we're still at today. So it's amazing that we have all of these social movements of revolt. But the big question will be, what will be the institutions that we build that bring us together, that bring us together and unite ourselves in struggle, whether that's within the nation, beyond the nation, and across racial, gender, uh, and class lines? All right, I'll leave it there. Excellent, John. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I will take uh, a couple of um, questions from the chat. I'll just uh, I'll just read them. Um, one of the first ones was um, from Saskia Krunenberg. Um, could the editors contributors elaborate on the distinction between Marxism and post Marxism? How do these ways of thinking interact? Um, and then one from uh, Doreen Mende. Uh, could the panel please say something about Marxism socialism as a project of modernity with specific concern for the violence of universality as universality by whom? And also please elaborate on the relation between Marxism or socialism or internationalism in relation to decolonization. In other words, what would the panel think about the need for decolonizing socialism as a source of struggle for the planetary contemporary? Um, a question from uh, Hibist Kassa. The unemployed, underemployed, peasantry and informal economy are spaces that create different relations that exist within, alongside, parallel and even against capital. The pastoral communities and nomad communities are always creating value in various forms. As Marx's production relations in these spheres um, and different forms of organizing are also crucial. So kind of a comment. Um, and then I'll just take a couple of more, a couple more and then um, perhaps I'll take uh, a couple of contributions from the floor um, so if the if the um, if the speakers could um, could uh, yeah answer those uh, um, at the very end um, from Peter Dwyer what does it really mean to the hundreds of millions of peasants smallholders own account workers and peoples in and out of the informal sectors in, in countries like India Nigeria Indonesia the citizens that Gayatri spoke of to appeal to them as a working class um, and then finally, Peter Burgess, uh, much of the global struggle against capitalism involves people and movements whose worldviews are deeply rooted in religious faith. How should Marxists work with people and movements of faith in global transformation? And is it necessary for Marxists to be self-critical with regard to our own understanding for solidarities to flourish? So that's quite a few questions. Um, so. Uh, so just to think about those, I'll take John Molyneux, and then uh, if a couple of the contributors want to uh, say something, I'll take you as well. So John. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Um I, I was going to ask Kieran Allen a question about James Connolly, but he's spoken already. So I'll say that what I'm going to say follows on very much from what uh, Trevor and Guani was saying, and in a way from what Kieran Allen was saying. Um, uh, and it is about the international working class. Um, all my life and all my time in the movement, the predominant discourse, certainly in the academy, was that the working class somehow was a thing of the past. It was either disappearing or it was being incorporated or it was no longer at any rate uh, a, a revolutionary subject. That was the dominant uh, argument in, uh, with, with even often from people who describe themselves as Marxists. Um, it always strikes me when you look at the world, uh, at the reality, that while all this discourse was going on, actually the working class 
was growing and is now infinitely larger force than it was in Marx's day or at any time uh, in the past. Enormously larger force than it was at the time of the, uh, of the, of the Russian Revolution. I mean, Marx was actually been proven correct that as capital grows, so, so does the proletariat, so does the working class. There are now, however you define it, hundreds of millions of workers in China, hundreds of millions in India, uh, uh, and so on. M millions upon millions in Africa. It, it doesn't, you know, you, we could have a long debate about who exactly is or isn't a worker, where the margins are, but however you define it, it is, it is clear that this is enormously expanded. And here I want to agree with the point that um, Kieran was making, which is that we are in a, a period, an age of revolt, and that if you look particularly at the moments before the pandemic, there was a huge wave of mass revolts right across the world in country after country, Lebanon, Chile, uh, Iraq, Ecuador, so on, I won't go through all uh, the lists, often mobilizing millions upon millions of people. Inevitably, even if those were not seen as or presented as self-conscious movements of the working class. Inevitably, these were movements of working class people. And uh, uh, therefore, when we talk about facing the uh, enormous challenges of the pandemic and climate change and the economic crisis, growing inequality and so on that everybody is referring to, I think socialists and Marxists have in this period a tremendous opportunity to relate to working class people in a way that we have not had for many generations, really going back to the great wave of uh, uh, surrounding the Russian Revolution and, uh, 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 and uh, the end of the First World War. An opportunity to heal the rift that was created by the victories, the twin victories of Hitler and Stalin in the in the 30s. So I am uh, a, a, an optimist about this, but we have to try and seize the opportunity in uh, in my in my opinion, because the potential is there. The working class of today not only is it larger and potentially more powerful, it's also more feminine, it's also more multiracial, uh, it is more open than uh, ever before, I think, uh, objectively, Thanks. to That's socialist fun. ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Faisy. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. That's, um, that's useful. Um, okay. Are there any um, contributors to the handbook that wanted to say a couple of words? You are more than welcome to raise your hand. Um, and uh, in the meantime, then, if there aren't any, I will take uh, a couple of more questions that we had uh, from the chat. One is from uh, Nandini Sen. Digital development is one of the biggest tools of the capitalists. The COVID-19 pandemic globally has shown and reflected that digital divide will, and that it will produce generations of educationally starved young and adults in economically poorer countries. How should we solve this acute problem, especially in poorer countries, and also in terms of um, race and gender? And then she followed it up with another question just to say, um, how should we look at and support the huge current farmers movements um, happening in India uh, during, during this pandemic? This movement will go um, down in, his in the history of the world. I think um, any, everyone can, can, can say something about that. Um, and then from, um, um, from Majid Akhtar, uh, from to, to Gayatri Spivak, could you please say more about citizen as agent of social change, given uh, this state-based relationship? What are the implications for internationalist uh, socialism? And then from Radhika Saraf, uh, given that the nation state is a bourgeois form, could you please elaborate on the citizen as the revolutionary subject? And if the framework of nation states rests on the declaration of the rights of man as citizen, in what ways can the Marxist project today challenge human rights discourse, which makes a distinction between man and citizen? Um, Okay, so uh, those are some uh, some more questions, and um, 
I just wondered, yeah, I just took just a call. I don't see any other hands. Um, so, oh, okay. And I know that Christian Hosberg is one of the um, contributors. So if you'd like to uh, speak for a couple of minutes and then I'll take Leo. Thanks. Thanks, Faisy. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, um, real pri yeah, privileged to be here and speak. I wasn't going to speak, but you just kept calling for contributors to speak. So I kind of thought I would. I just want to do one thing, which just kind of show people physically the book, because it is absolute kind of uh, monster, really, in sort of size and uh, scale. Um, yeah, it's it's sort of tremendous thing. Uh, achievement. It's a brick, really. It's a worse well, of more than a brick. It's a yeah. Um, it's a, I don't know, a building brick for building the future social society, I don't know. Um, what I wanted to talk about CLR James a little bit, because that's my uh, sort of contribution. And obviously it's James, CLR James was born 120 years ago in Trinidad. So, um, you know, it was his 120th birthday nominally this year, if he's, he's still been around. So, but if there's a new real resurgent, rightly, in, of, of interest in James and in his importance, um, for reasons kind of Alex was talking about, the same reasons that Du Bois has got a great deal of attention. He was one of the most important theorists, really, of the relationship of capitalism and slavery um, in, tradition, in that tradition, and thinking about racism, colonialism, uh, more broadly from a, from a Marxist framework, and, uh, you know, coming out of the sort of Trotskyist tradition and building in some way, you know, in so many ways on Trotsky's history of Russian Revolution to write his great book, Black Jacobins. And so on, and there's, you know, it's, I mean, it's fantastic that James has come really to the, to the fore, really, thank, thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement, really, but, you know, we've had the Steve McQueen's fantastic Small Axe films, which people go and see, which talk, you know, which references the inspiration of Black Jacobins for uh, Black Power movements in Britain, um, and, uh, yeah, Dark, Dark as How and the Mangrove uh, Nine trial. Um, and how it inspired people during, who were involved in Brixton riots in 1981, um, Alex Wheatle and, and so on. And, um, but I guess it's, it's one thing I suppose it's, you know, that Alex uh, sort of alluded to was just, you know, if you think about how you diversify this, you know, think about this tradition. I mean, I suppose one, you know, one, one thing about James was he was, his, his, his theory was concerned with a period of state capitalism, really. That was his great... Uh, project to try and think through that moment in the middle of the 20th century, 30s, 40s, 50s, analyze that on a global scale, think about the idea of state capitalism, as well as his contribution to black liberation and theorizing that and anti-colonial, you know, colonial liberation. But thinking about that big process of state capitalism, I guess one thing about James was he he never really properly the theorized um, neoliberalism. He was too, I guess he was too old on, on one level. But I guess one, you know, one figure um, and and his, his writings on Africa in some ways, on one level, his because he was so intimately involved in part with the big early leaders of pan African, you know, pan African liberation like Kwame Nkrumah and so on. He he wasn't quite as critical of them as he could have been uh, in the in the po post post war period of decolonization. I think someone like Walter Rodney's importance there in terms of carrying on the best of that tradition of James in terms of thinking about the African working class um, and some of the questions you know Trevor Nguyen was talking about. Um, there, I think I think Rodney would be one figure. I think you know, uh, as well as as well as figures like Du Bois, um, figures uh, figures. I mean, even Eric Williams thinking about capitalism and slavery is, is somewhat you know something to think about. But also the you know the much broader, um, yeah, writers who've, who've come from 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 the yeah out out of kind of black liberation struggles towards revolutionary Marxism. I think there's a great opportunity with the Black Lives Matter movement um, to have real you know engaged arguments again and actually win potential new generation of black radicals to the ideas of revolutionary Marxism by recovering some of that, some of that uh, rich, uh, yeah, political tradition. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Christian. Um, so next we'll hear from Leo Zelig and uh, then I'll take a, a, um, a few more questions from the chat. For the speakers. Okay, hi, um, thanks hi. a lot. I, I just wanted to echo something that Alex said right at the start of his, uh, his presentation, which is, perhaps what signals the satisfaction or the success of this dictionary is that you pick it up, this handbook rather, that you pick it up and you, uh, you delight in the contributions, but you also rage about what's not in there. And I, I think that is a sign of how um, engaged it is and also its readers. And I think, of course, one of the obvious 
um, absences is um, Walter Rodney, a great um, Marxist, as, Chris, as Christian has just um, said. I wrote a short um, contribution essay on Franz Fanon. And as many of you know, Franz Fanon is the uh, incredibly important thinker, really, of the 60s and 70s and on, uh, uh, figurehead of the Black Lives Matter movement, and, a, and a, uh, a thinker, an activist of remarkable subtlety and complexity. And he did a whole number of things which it's vital for us, particularly in a handbook like this, to be discussing. He managed through the appalling blockage of Stalinism and without being um, or considering himself a Marxist to work out concepts of national liberation and revolution and essentially political and economic struggle across national boundaries without the help of the Marxist, the classical Marxist toolbook and of Trotsky in particular, although he read Trotsky to some extent. So in with ferocious originality, he manages to start asking the questions before anyone else does really about the limits of decolonization and the possibilities of what he described of as universal emancipation once the European working class stopped playing their game of Sleeping Beauty as he persuasively and beautifully put it. But there were other problems which um, it's important to embrace and because he wrote his last book, The Wretched of the Earth, in such a hurry, uh, it was a draft, really, of course, because he was dying in um, the year that he was writing it. He, he's very confused about um, class. So he talks about um, the peasantry as being the real wretched of the earth, the poorest of the poor. And, of course, it was the ideas of the lumpen proletariat that Huey P. Newton um, celebrated in um, the later 1960s, a fantastic reader, interpreter of Fadden in many ways. But he ditches the working class very much as an agent of possible progressive transformation. But however, this deep and complex involvement with Marxism explicitly, but more often around the rim of those Marxist debates makes Fadden, I think, a, a, an important addition to this dictionary and a very, um, uh, a very, uh, very exciting and important thinker today. Thank you, Leo. That's that's great. Um, okay. So I'm going to uh, read a couple of more, a few more uh, contributions from from the chat. Um, I've got about um, roughly ten minutes, and then I'm going to ask the uh, the panelists to uh, to come back. So from Kishore um, Birdikar uh, for Gayatri Spivak, how do we react to the idea of value generation being used in the work of development as as main as a main source or idea of social change? Value here is completely dehistoricized. How can we link Marxist ideas of value to the work of development? And then from Surya Parekh, um, can you um, can can Gayatri talk about the difference between um, nociology and epistemology um, that she discusses in her chapter Global Marx uh, in relation to learning to use Marx? Um, and then from um, Alpish Mysuria, um, what are the general views of the contributors on MMT, modern monetary theory, and also uh, new materialism? And then uh, just a few more, Adam, Adam Wadley. Uh, my uh, question arises from a course uh, I'm in on civil war. Can anyone mention work which addresses the homology between civil war and class struggle or other Marxist theorizing on civil war? Um, and then um, from H. Fridman, the 2020s will be the most turbulent decade in the history of our species. First, capitalism is facing increasing difficulties reproducing itself as evidenced by the fall in the rate of profit beginning in China in 2011, followed by the US in 2014, hence the collapse in longer term global investment. Um, second, the march of the robots, machine learning uh, leading to 40% unemployment. Um, third, global warming. Fourth, the hegemonic struggle between the US and China. The, the crisis of capitalism is our opportunity for change. Perhaps you can comment on that. And uh, finally, from Rob Stewart, um, 
uh, Trevor, you're right. We need to dream. We have a problem, though. The mainstream media, which is owned by a handful of millionaires who will not permit any alternative vision to be promoted or discussed. The status quo is asserted as the only option, which is madness given the reality of our desperate situation. Social media alternatives Social media allows alternative visions to be shared, but without due editorial process, conspiracy theories and lies are everywhere. Would you agree that the breakdown of reliable information is a leading contributing factor in the rise of disillusionment and disengagement um, where it exists and that structural power inherent in the MSM in particular um, must be addressed as a matter of urgency? Um, so, those are some of the questions uh, from the chat. I would also like to call again, once again, if there are any contributors uh, to the handbook who want to speak for uh, two to three minutes, um, and then I will bring um, the uh, panelists back to comment on all of those questions um, or any of them that uh, they choose. Is, um, did Paul LeBlanc want to speak? Sorry, I, he hasn't got his hand up, but, um, uh, and also Rick Kuhn. Okay, so I'll take Paul LeBlanc and then I'll take Rick Kuhn. Paul. Um, there are several things that I want to say. Uh, I think that the title of the uh, handbook is uh, misleading and a disaster because if you try to use it as a handbook, you'll hurt your hand. You need both hands. It is so large and it's so full of uh, all kinds of great stuff. Uh, I think it's a wonderful resource. And at the same time, um, I've been troubled as I've been thinking about it and listening. And I wanna share that with you. Uh, the nature of Marxism, I remember something I read from Trotsky a, while, a long time ago that said essentially, if you're not involved in the working class and building the working class movement and so forth, then the Marxism doesn't make any sense, something like that, um, which is something that I've felt uh, all my life. Um, and so can we bring the changes that we're talking about that we need? Uh, it seems to me that's the point of Marxism. Um, and, uh, I'm frustrated and have been frustrated and feel an intense frustration uh, over that question. Um, the kind of mass working class movements and the possibility of revolution coming from that that seemed to exist at the time of Luxembourg or Trotsky, that hasn't existed. Uh, and uh, we've got to build it, we've got to rebuild it. But then there are the crises that are coming in that pose the question, do we have time? Do we have time to build what needs to be built to bring about what we need? Um, and uh, that's not clear to me. So that's a, a, a profound frustration. And I can have in, interesting intellectual discussions with people about the kinds of things we're talking about. But how can we get it to click in in a way that brings about actual change and opens up possibilities for change. And it's seemed at various times like, oh, here's a possibility and then it's squash or here's a possibility and it discredits itself. So um, that's a question that's posed in my mind. I have had a sense in certain other countries, sometimes in my own fleetingly, uh, oh my God, they're doing something in Ireland. Oh, this amazing thing has happened in India or South Africa, or you know, there's a need to uh, have not just a, a, an international discussion like this, but it seems to me some kind of something, I'm not sure what, that can help to bring the theory in line with practice, socialism and the working class coming together in a way that uh, does bring hope for the future. So as I'm thinking about things, as I'm listening to this, as I'm uh, engaging with the handbook, that's something that, uh, that's a challenge that I'm feeling that troubles me because uh, I don't have an honest, <laughs> an honest answer to that. Um, so those are my thoughts, <laughs> that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay, so I'll finally take Rick Kuhn and then um, possibly one more question from the chat and then we'll have time for um, Gayatri and then Trevor and 
either Lucia or Stathis Kubalakis, if he's here, to uh, finally wrap up uh, the event. So, um, um, Rick. Rick, we can't hear you. No, no, we can't. Do you perhaps, yeah, or do you want to put your uh, question in the chat if that's possible? And I can read it out. Okay, so um, if Rick might be able to sort um, his audio out, um, and in the meantime, I'll take a couple of questions um, from the chat. So um, from Gonzalez Carmen, could you further elaborate, this is for Gayatri, could you further elaborate on the role of affects in capitalism? You talked about greed, violence, and fear driving, ca driving capitalism's dark side. Um, in, Amer in Central America and Mexico, there is a phenomenon of um, extreme violence establishing capitalist markets in the field of death and violence. This coming from the sector of the population that has completely been excluded from capitalist exploitation and is searching for social mobility through something that can be described as necro empowerment. How could we address this specific problem? Um, and um, then there's another one from Roberto Garace. Um, can you please elaborate about the validity of the concept of real abstraction? I think it can be very useful to frame uh, the progressive computerization and intellectualization of work. Um, and I think that's all. Um, so Rick, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to, um, to sort your audio out. Um, if you haven't, um, there's, I can see one more hand, um, from Lawrence Wong. So Lawrence, um, if you can be very brief, I'll take you, um, and then we will move to, um, the panelists to wrap up. Can you say something about the Taliban as citizen? Because it seems to me for 20 years, NATO has fought the Taliban to peace talks. So the Taliban fighters must be over the moon, not at all depressed. So what is the citizen for a Taliban fighter? Okay, <laughs> thanks, Lawrence. Um, yes, if uh, just someone was saying, if, uh, if Rick, you can sort your mic out, I'd be happy to take you before the end of the, before the end of the, oh, maybe that is, maybe we can hear you. Hello. Yes. Okay. That's great. <laughs> You're on. Yeah. I, I didn't want to ask a, a question. I uh, want to be presumptuous in a way, I think, that Lenin Assar in answering one, and that is about the uh, issue of there are so many crises of capitalism. This is a fantastic opportunity. Well, I think that's true. But as Paul LeBlanc said, there, there are circumstances in which opportunities can be taken advantage of better than others. And crucially, uh, to take an av advantage of these crises, to transform the responses of people to crisis, the struggles that people that have arisen uh, in response to the crisis into revolution, requires revolutionary organisation, requires revolutionary parties uh, with roots in the working class. Well, and they don't exist. Well, we need to make them. We need to make them exist. We need to be part of revolutionary organisations that aren't parties rooted in the working class and try and build them into that. Henrik Grossman, who, uh, about who I wrote a contribution to the handbook, uh, was very clear about this, although he's been portrayed as a theorist of automatic or mechanical breakdown of capitalism. He drew on Lenin. He said, Lenin had it right. In order for the revolution to occur, it was necessary not only that uh, vast numbers of people need to feel 
that change is necessary and for the ruling class to be unclear about its way forward it was also necessary to have that subjective factor and that subjective factor uh, is a revolutionary party of the working class so yes the handbook i think can be a weapon uh, an ideological weapon but i'd like to see people who look at it transform it into a physical weapon as well not to belay members of the ruling class immediately about the head to move into armed struggle armed with uh, the physical object of the handbook but to look forward to that kind of struggle in the future by helping to build revolutionary currents distinct from reformism uh, that are committed to the self-emancipation of the working class. Thanks so much, Rick. That was um, worth waiting for. Okay, so um, I'd like to then call on um, Gayatri and Trevor, and perhaps Lucia could say then a few words at the very end um, for five minutes each, uh, just so we can uh, finish the, 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 the launch at uh, 5 p.m. You don't have to take the whole five minutes um, and obviously answer what you feel you want to answer. So Gayatri. Gayatri, you're on, you're on mute. <laughs> okay. Post-Marxism. I don't really know what post-Marxism is, uh, but um, Alex called me a post-Marxist. So I would say that, um, uh, like many things, post-Marxism is well theorized by Marx and Engels in the 1872 uh, edition of the Communist Manifesto, the introduction that they wrote. They said not to uh, read the parts of the revolution, parts on the revolution seriously anymore because the big business, I'm almost quoting verbatim because I tell my students to read that all the time. Big business has moved so far in 25 years, big business they say, 25 years, that all of the revolutionary stuff that they wrote is fair altered. In other words, uh, the, you know, too old, out of, uh, um, no, no longer useful. And they say that we have kept it as we have because it's become a historical icon. I think the brothers are telling us how to use them. In other words, move with the way in which capital as such moves and use us historically. That, that's, I suppose, for me, post-Marxism. I don't think of myself as a post-Marxist, I think of myself as a Marxist. So therefore, that's what I'll say about post-Marxism. You cut me off on five minutes, okay? I didn't look at the time. I so will. Thank I you. think the biggest question that people have asked me is the question about citizenship. See, the thing is that uh, uh, the um, uh, Leo uh, Zelig, when he talked about Fano, he was right on the spot. The, the, in that chapter uh, two, I think, or three, where he's talking about post-colonial nations, the limits of decolonization, he has a complete, um, uh, com he completely, he thinks he, the leaders, and he uses the English word, he thinks the leaders are the worst thing in post uh, so-called post-colonial states. He didn't even see this, but he described uh, the misuse of democracy as body count completely. And the so-called, you know, like uh, really uh, uh, para-paternalistic states, which are being, you, uh, which are supposedly used in democratic formation today, where democracy is only body count. That's why I was talking about citizenship. The Marx says the now of course citizen bourgeois for us has become a bad word, but it, the word is bürgerlich, right? For Marx, and bürger that is a citizen. So to an extent, the, the what the bourgeois revolution did, if you think of the Marseillaise, they called the sokirot citoyen. That's the was the big thing. So but that was not enough, and so Marx says. The task of the bourgeois, the bürgerlich, is bürgerliche Gesellschaft, is to establish the world market. This is 
This is what the citizen, this is what the Bürgerliche Gesellschaft does. Now, in our time, the, uh, the, the voter as body count, it's the hugest sector of the electorate. That's why I so agree, agree with Molyneux that you cannot keep Marxism in the, at the universities. Everybody talks the talk. That's why I tried, they don't walk the walk. That's why I tried st to step away from the book and talk about the limits of my little activism where you begin to learn that your learning is a hampering thing. This uh, kind of uh, competitive uh, scholarship where you are correct and you're correct and you're being a correct Marxist, it's, it hampers you. You cannot talk to the largest sector of the electorate, where Fanon knew this, that because of the class apartheid in education, they in fact bring in the tyrants that are so-called democracy, voting arithmetical democracy, voting as body count. They bring in the tyrants who rule the world today. That, that's five minutes, Kayashi. Good, good, so therefore I will say citizenship is the only social contract that we have, we must question citizenship in a nation state as we use citizenship in order to generalize because global capitalism calls itself post-national, but the, the measurement of development is nation state by nation state. But there's much more to say, but five minutes is five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That's excellent. Um, uh, so next, we'll hear from Trevor. Uh, five thanks. minutes, Trevor. Thanks. Okay, please tell me when it's five minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I want to say that uh, there are certain problems which derive from within the working class movement. <clears throat> so it's not about Marxism or even about the bourgeoisie, but its problems and challenges within our movement. So for example, you get trade unions and working class parties, you know, where many years of bosses politics has entered deeper and deeper. You know, you get uh, workers who see for many years, their leaders carrying the message of bosses to workers rather than of the workers to bosses. You get um, leader, worker leaders who talk about laws from parliament, ignoring the laws of working class life. And then you get workers who don't feel that they belong in their own organizations, in their own unions. So they don't feel that they have a place in their organizations, a place where they can be at home, where they can raise ideas, any demand, any suggestion, any question, any criticism. So those workers are there, you know, physically, you know, in the collective, but they are alone. So that's a, those problems you can address within the movement, you know, and, and then another thing which maybe is partly related is that uh, there is nothing as strong as inspiring and which will change your life, you are part of it as a workers movement, movement on the move, fighting behind its demands, fighting, you know, behind the vision of alternatives. You know, there's just, you know, nothing greater than that, you know, for social change. So now we find that there are now generations of people, youth, who have never seen this, who have never known the meaning, meaning of workers' democracy, who have never seen workers' power in their own lives. So they've never felt that strength and hope of a mobilized working class movement, broadly defined working class movement, a mass movement. So they have never been allowed that vision, you know, that together we can make a different future. Okay. People got a taste of that a bit with Black Lives Matter, but we know that, you know, the organized labor was not there. Uh, workers, if they were there, they were there, you know, under their own individual cognizances. So it is in those contexts that the socialist vision, you know, gets dim, where hope gets trampled upon. And then 
you know, you get ideas that, you know, there can be no future. Um, and another important point is that it's so easy, you know, for the older generation to convey to the younger generation despair, uh, dashed hopes, rather than to convey the heroism, determination and sacrifice and hope, which they felt, you know, during their struggles. It's what's happening in South Africa. You know, guys my age, they were there in the 80s. We live that, we thrive on that, but we're not conveying it, you know, to the youth. You know, we just tell them how uh, we're sold out. So, you know, this is, and this leads to a situation where, you know, when things which were possible in the past did not happen, maybe it's missed opportunities, maybe it's bad tactics, then people say it was impossible. It was never going to happen. So this is very important. And then my last point. That's fine. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Fine. Yeah, it's five minutes. Okay. You can make your last point. Okay, my last point is that South Africa was once known for many years now, recently in post-apartheid as the protest capital of the world. And then in 2011, the Arab Spring came and then the attention shifted. So the point is that when the people were protesting in South Africa, there was no notion of regime change. You know, it was just demanding from the government. But even in the, with the Arab Spring, when you know the regime's Mubarak fell, there was no notion of replacing you know uh, that power with grassroots power, working class power. So in the end, it becomes a call for free and fair elections. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes we struggle, but instead of trying to grab power for the masses, we see it, we give away power. So I think it's important also to look at, and then, you know, what happens is that the new regimes, they're just there to uh, nest and make sure that exhausted bourgeois democracy capitalist regimes in the name of equality and free and fair elections thrive. So we need a vision of alternatives, taking the power to ordinary people on the ground. Thank you so much. Thanks, Trevor. Um, so finally, we're here from uh, Lucia, one of the editors of the handbook. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for coming this evening. It's been really amazing to listen to all of you. And um, I, I just wanted to start with what uh, Trevor said at the beginning, and I think he's right that um, one of the kind of ideas behind this uh, handbook has been uh, to look at Marx, uh, Marx's ideas and Marxism as um, a theory that tries to understand capitalism as a totality, and in doing so, tries to look beyond capitalism, and so becomes also a um, a tool of struggle to dream and also create a different future. And I think that the kind of variety and the richness of the contributions uh, want to kind of go beyond some reductionist interpretations of Marx's uh, theory of exploitation and really show that um, what Gayatri Spivak called the theft of surplus value and understanding the mechanisms behind this theft of surplus value is really the way in which uh, workers can get empowered and learn about their collective power and see that capitalism in the end, it's uh, their own creation and the, therefore they can learn about their transformative power as well. And I think it's important to bear in mind that Marx wasn't talking just about factory workers, but also was trying to analyze the ways in which um, exploitation, capitalist exploitation is intertwined with uh, continuing processes of uh, primitive accumulation. And, and so the expropriation of uh, direct producers, peasants, uh, state and colonial violence continue alongside don't just continue alongside exploitation, but are also shaped and shape uh, labor exploitation. And I think that what we are witnessing today is quite an example of this, the way in which colonial and imperialist violence are expanding a reserve, a global reserve army 
of unemployed and underemployed workers that are at the same time mobilized by the forces of uh, accumulation and at the same time trapped by new mechanisms of global apartheid that uh, also fuel uh, racism uh, in, in the global system. And so I think um, this kind of analysis help us looking at capitalism as a global system. It, it's also helping us to see uh, the way in which struggles uh, in, in the workplace around wages, working conditions, working times are linked to struggles over dispossession, such a reproduction, ecology, imperialism and racism. And also, I think um, the reflections by Marx himself show how the support for the struggles of the most marginalized and oppressed by the organized workers is key for, for the movement to, to go ahead. And I think that um, it's on this terrain of struggle really that the deep organic link between production and reproduction and the globality of Marxist thought becomes concrete when diversity becomes uh, solidarity and uh, radicalism in, in the struggle. And I think that just to conclude, uh, this point is quite important going back to the debate because uh, it allows us to see the current age as an age both of catastrophe and global revolt. And I think uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic is really bringing this kind of contradictions to the fore because it's showing the consequences of a ecological system that is based on dispossession, ecological uh, degradation and deforestation, and is creating the conditions for these pandemics uh, to, to, to spread. And so I think that uh, looking at the kind of roots of the current pandemic is important because it help us, uh, helps us link struggles uh, on the work, around the workplaces. So for safe jobs, to protect our jobs, to protect our working conditions, how these struggles are linked to the struggles against dispossession, against marketization of rural relations like what's going on in India. Uh, right now, which uh, should give uh, a sense of hope and power to the workers around the world and just realize how powerful we can be. And I think what's the problem right now is that many parties and also trade unions are not emphasizing the power that we have, how capital is dependent on our, on our own power, but they're emphasizing the weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And I think that adopting a global approach and looking at these kind of connections between struggles is, is really important to go to the roots of the problems, but also to develop a global response that uh, allows us to reappropriate our, our power right now. So I hope that even if it is not possible to carry the handbook with just one hand, uh, well, this will be a tool uh, for future, for present and future generations uh, to think about uh, the way forward together. Excellent. Thank you, Lucia. And thanks to all the editors and thanks to all the contributors and everyone who came. This has been a brilliant launch and congratulations again to, um, to the editors uh, and the contributors of the, of the handbook. I just wanted to say that um, the seminar in contemporary Marxist theory um, again, the people who organised this, this book launch is organised by a network of scholars at King's College London, LSE, Queen Mary, uh, Loughborough University and the University of Greenwich. And the next uh, seminar will be in two weeks time on Wednesday, the 3rd of March from 4.15 to uh, 6.15. Um, and the title of that talk of that seminar will be Neoliberalism and Empire, Latin American and Eastern European Perspectives. And uh, there'll be three panellists, Quinn Slobodian uh, discussing his book, Globalists, The End of Empire. Empire and the birth of neoliberalism. Uh, also Virginia Fontes from Universidad Federal Fluminense in Brazil. And um, Balaz, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Balaz Trenseni um, from Central European University. So that's in two weeks time um, at 4.15 and you're all more than welcome to come. Thanks everyone for, uh, for coming again. Um, and again, that recording will be on the Facebook page as I understand it of the seminar um, in uh, Contemporary Marxist Theory. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks very much, Dr. Spivak and Nguani. Professor, and you, Faisy, for sharing. Well, a wonderful, wonderful discussion.
I want to speak now for two hours, but I don't think it's possible. <laughs> I want to respond to everyone. Thank Yachty, you very much. I think you're a Marxist. Apologies for mislabeling you. <laughs> You discovered at the end of a handbook on Marxism and post-Marxism that you mislabeled her, Alex. I know. <laughs> well, it was worth doing it to discover that. <laughs> well, that's all right. You were irritated by Pomo, but you did not think that I was one of them because I'm not in that book, thank God. <laughs> I bought it in 1991. In fact, it's right here. Great. Thank you very much. It's Thanks really everyone. Fun. It's oh, really fun, I must say.